Geneviève de Ruron, 21 ans. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our December 6th vigil. My name is Charlene Catchpole, and I am the Executive Director of North York Women's Shelter here in Toronto. And I'm just going to uh, start us off in opening up our evening with a smudge. As uh, an Aboriginal woman uh, living in the city, we do a smudge to bring our hearts together as one, our mind, our voice, our souls to connect us all. I'll be burning sage tonight and after uh, I turn around and I'm going to smudge behind us and pay some respect to all of those lives that have been lost, that we've been touched by, our sisters, our mothers, our aunties, our friends, our colleagues, and then I'm just going to walk around behind the perimeter and smudge everybody. If uh, you would like me to stop and smudge, just put out your hand and, and I'll do that. Okay? Thank you.
I invite our grandmothers and our sisters who have left us far too soon to be with us here tonight, to hear our words, listen to our prayers, to stop the violence that invades our lives. Miigwech. We are Women Won't Forget. Welcome to the December 6th vigil. We're still here 23 years after the Montreal massacre because Native women are still missing and still being found murdered and their lives and deaths are still being ignored. We're still here because recent changes to immigration law means that refugee women will be forced to stay with their abuser for two years or risk being banished from the country where they sought refuge. We're still here because we live in a rape culture where sexual assault victims are still being blamed for the crimes committed against them. We're still here because women who are murdered by men are forgotten or blamed while the media dissects the lives of their killers to see what their victims did that would cause them to kill her. And misogyny is seldom part of the discussion. We're still here because there are more bodies to bury and more women to remember, and we will still be here until violence against women is nothing but an ugly footnote in history. So thank you for standing with us. Bonsoir et bienvenue. Nous sommes Women Won't Forget, l'association, une association locale féministe. Cette journée souligne l'anniversaire du meurtre de 14 jeunes femmes à l'école polytechnique de Montréal, tuées simplement pour la raison de leur sexe. Le 6 décembre offre aux Canadiennes et aux Canadiens l'occasion de réfléchir et de se questionner l'épidémie de violence envers les femmes et jeunes et jeunes filles dans notre société. La violence sexiste n'est par personne. Chaque année, nous nous réunissons au bloc mémoire de ce souvenir et pour dénoncer cette violence. Nous jurons à ne pas oublier ces femmes et toutes les femmes qui vivent avec la violence, qui sont morts à cause de la violence et ceux qui ont survécu. Merci. Now we are very honored to invite Angel Wolf to speak to you. Ani and hello. My name is Angel Wolf. My Indian name is Woman of Sacred Dreams. I am 19 years old and I am presently taking a year off school due to the inquiry. I love photography and poetry. I am also a survivor. I grew up as a crown ward in the care of CAS, but recently was able to find my youngest half-sister and now have a family who I reside with. I have been through a lot due to my mother's passing. My mom's name was Brenda Ann Wolf. She was murdered by Robert Picton in Vancouver, BC. I was eight years old when I found out about her death. I grew up with her name all over the press, and I heard many grotesque details of those murdered in the downtown east side. I have heard many untrue, untrue stories about my mother, too. I remember my mother. She was a very happy person, loved music, and always dancing and singing. I grew up with my mother and my abusive father. She tried to leave my dad, but that never worked out. I can remember happy memories with my mother, though, because my parents had separate places. Finally, my mom fell hard to her addictions, and I was in my dad's care and was moving to Toronto due to, her, due to my mother being sick. My mom kept in contact by telephone when I was in Toronto and living with my grandma. My dad's girlfriend at that time, Bridget, was introduced into my life. She took care of us, and I grew a great connection with her. I always remember her giving me the phone to talk to my mother in BC, because my father didn't necessarily promote me and my mother's birth relationship. I could talk to my mom regularly, and then finally the call stopped. My dad, oblivious to the fact that my birth mother had stopped calling her children, Bridget wasn't. She knew if my mother was in jail or in the hospital or something, someone or she would have called to tell Bridget or her children to let us know that she was fine. Bridget knew something was wrong. She had gotten concerned about my mom and talked to her sister, who was out west, to look for her out there. Bridget got news from her sister that men, my mom hasn't been seen. Last time I talked to my mom, I was about six years old. Shortly after, my dad started to lose himself to more and more drugs and alcohol, and my grandma died and left him with all her estate. He lost all responsibilities and lost us to CAS. 
I was then put into a na uh, native group home, which after got closed down for sexual and physical abuse going on in the home. Then CAS finally crown warded me, and I was placed into a Jewish foster home, where I spent most of my years there. Growing up there, I couldn't properly, properly identify myself as a First Nation. In my, in my mind, I was just as Jewish as the people I was living with, until the cold, brutal truth came knocking at the door. I remember that day the police came to my foster home. I was eight, and the brutal truth that came knocking was, so, we may have found your mother's DNA on a pig farm like it was just finding a missing needle in a haystack. So monotone, no emotion at all. Then, we we're already inside the home, so I couldn't ignore this. Next, the man said to me, so Angel, if you don't mind, we need to question you. I can still remember like it was yesterday. They started, just, they started to just talk to me. He continued on asking me his questions. Sorry. Ugh. Continued on asking me his questions one after another. I really couldn't stop thinking that they were what they, they told me was a lie. Because in my mind, as a little eight year old girl, I still thought that I was finding my mom one day. Finally, the officer was over questioning me. To me, it felt like an interrogation. For me, living in foster care for a couple of years gave me enough time to become a very angry, abandoned feeling little girl. I had trust and authority issues through the roof for moving around and finally the home I ended up living in wasn't the home for me. The people who were running it participated in their own religion but taught me nothing about mine. I was very confused about my identity and did not identify myself as a native for the longest time. But finally the news hit me. My mom was murdered. Brenda Ann Wolf was a, was a mother. She was an Aboriginal woman who was killed by Robert Picton. He got away with this because, like my mom and many of these other women, they were of high-risk groups and of marginalized communities. They were already forgotten in society's eyes. The police ignored them and the problem almost for two decades until finally they realized that there was a monster in the downtown east side that was taking women from their streets but with no crime scenes. Many missing women were already reported by my friends, by many friends and family. It took 31 women to just vanish off the streets before the authorities could, couldn't ignore it any longer. So finally a missing task force was made. Um, and on February 6, 2002, Robert Picton's farm was raided by the police. They had found their crime scene. The media and everyone wanted to identify these women as drug addicted sex workers. Not to me, I see them as survivors. I remember looking at the f poster for the first time to see 69 different women, but what I saw was hurt families, other people's mothers, sisters, aunties, and, f and friends. And what hurts the most is at first, not one, not no one wanted to perceive that story in the media. I would like to now sh share a poem that I wrote for my mom and the missing woman. Sixty women that died years on a farm. Most of them I did not know, but one of them was close to my heart. One of them I knew from the start. One of them was my mother. I thought I knew her like no other. I did not know what she kept from me, and that's the secret that tore apart my family. Life isn't normal anyways. At least I found loved ones to spend the holidays. Time has been taken from our frame because somehow my mom was too busy with devils like whiskey and cocaine. And it was only them that led you to a man that was worse, that would take your life and not let us converse. I'm your daughter, I should not be asking myself why. Why no one cared about my mom and let these women die. I used to blame myself all the time for all her wrongs and all her crimes. I try to forget all the bad times and remember all the good. I really try, but for now, I hardly ever cry. I wish you were still here with me instead of drowning in drugs and misery. But I pretend each day this smile you see and try to hide each day deep inside. I hope there's a but deep inside, Mom, I hope there's a brighter place you lay. There is no time to say goodbye, no time to see eye to eye, but on I must go, I know this. There's no other way. The frustrated fears and lowly days will soon be at flight. Strong will I say, at least no deep inside, Mom, there's a safer place you lay. I am lucky, though. I could have followed in her footsteps, having the society as my parents. Having the society as my parents allowed me to have to not have proper supervision. I ran away for six months from the care of CAS and ended up finding my mom, my stepmom Bridget, who right from the start had reminded me that my mom loved me. She had gotten custody, and even though our home is crowded with kids, cats, and dogs, it is also filled with tons of love. 
Bridget has set me up with a lot of people, and for the first time ever, I felt like I had a community. And it was the community and my stepmom that helped me for a, helped me a lot at first to get the strength to speak up. Now I tell my story so I can inspire people and have a voice. I'm in, and have a voice. I'm involved in many organizations, one called Canadian Roots Foundation Exchange and Sex Trade 101 as a child youth advocate. I am strongly support of the Nordic model and do not believe the prostitution is a choice and the promotion of sex work in our community is wrong. I believe that Canada needs to learn from its mistakes and this year, let me tell you, I had the Missing Women's Task Force come to my house. I got to see the photos and crime scene layouts and let me tell you, in the air of that room, all I felt was error. I was offered $10,000 for my mom from the Crime Victims Unit. That amount is nothing. My mom will never be there to see me graduate, to walk me down the aisle, or stand beside me when I give birth. Canada needs to wake up and see the body count. A thousand plus missing and murdered Aboriginal women is, in Canada is an atrocity. This is genocide. What can we do so that these women are, uh, are accounted for? We need to keep up this dialogue and continue with more awareness. Also, we mean more detox bed, treatment centers, and less promotion of sex work in our society. Yeah. And this past year, I have participated in the Missing Women Inquiry. I have heard all the stories from the families and would like to share a few with you. One mother expressed how the police came to notify her at a bingo hall where her and her mother spent afternoons the VPD missed her by 10 minutes, and when she arrived home, there was a message on her answering machine from the corners saying her 20-year-old daughter's DNA was found on a pig farm. There was another notification from a different family at the bingo hall, where the mother was left screaming on the floor for her daughter. Another family was told um, their missing mom might just be fish food, or she's just on a vacation. I do hold the VPD accountable. They dismissed that there was a predator in the downtown east side. And I also want to leave you guys with this. I also want to leave this question with you all. How would you, know, how would you cope knowing that your mom was grounded up and placed in a freezer? Hard to digest, eh? Come on, this is what all of the families are living through each day. We have to be their voice and make sure that this does not die. Now that the inquiry is over, we need a national inquiry. And please let's not forget these women who some were mothers, sisters, sisters, daughters, and even grandmothers. They too cherished life and many gave life. And I will make sure those women won't get forgotten. Thank you. My name is Vanessa McGowan, and uh, I'm a singer and spoken word artist uh, locally here in Toronto. Um, and uh, I just want to thank Angel for getting on this stage, um, and all of you for being here. Uh, so I have a poem to share with you. The worst insult is to be called female. Bitch, pussy, cunt, Ho, oh, girly. These words have passed my mouth without apology, without conscious knowledge. Here stands a grown ass woman, fist pumping 15 years ago, proud feminist, admitting it. I've been eating the lie fed us all, hoodwinked into thinking the fight is over. Those words still hold hatred like cast iron holds heat used to bully and belittle men, have brought most of the women in this crowd to their knees with fear or pain. Keep us all safe and warm in our little boxes, gender roles held tight like the illusion of a promise ring. I somehow forgot those words are still patriarchy's battle cry, alive and well. Used before that fist flies at her face, or the money hits the nightstand for the girl who should be in eighth grade. Women who live to dance but can only get jobs that pay in hip hop videos. I won't agree by cultural coercion. Number one, we're not dogs. 
Number two, I'm the proud owner of my clitoris. And number three, selling sex says absolutely nothing about a woman's character. I'm not sorry, and I won't bite my tongue. Thank you. My name is Susan Young. I'm the director of the Ontario Association in Interval and Transition Houses. We're an association that represents the first stage and second stage emergency homes for women in this province. When I arrived here tonight with my professional speech ready to speak and I saw all of these, I started crying. I started weeping with despair over the years and years that this has happened, that women keep being murdered. And I looked up at the CN Tower, which you can see there is lit up in purple because some of the survivors in this province who work with our association very persistently asked the folks who run the CN Tower to change the light to purple to acknowledge December 6th to bring increased awareness to woman abuse. We know that we've gathered here today because 23 years ago 14 women were murdered and 13 additional women injured at the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal by Mark Lapine, who then killed himself. And today we want to remember those women and all the women that have been murdered. Some of them we see behind us here. So all the women in this community, in this province and in this country, as well as the world, who continue to be murdered. Violence against women and girls destroys lives causes great harm to our communities and to our society at all layers. And we know that 50% of women in Canada experience sexual or domestic violence in their lifetimes. And Aboriginal women, women with disabilities, immigrant women and other women experience an even higher rate. If you look around you, that means one out of two women standing here now have experienced some form of violence. We have broken the silence surrounding violence against women and girls over the last 40 years. The first shelter started here in Toronto in 1973. And we've taken some action, but not enough. The Executive Director of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women has called on all countries to develop a national action plan to end violence against women. The Beijing Platform for Action was developed in 1993, and that's an international agreement that already points the way forward for us. OAIF is a member of a national coalition of women's organizations, labors and labor organizations and shelters, and we're calling on the Canadian government to develop a comprehensive national action plan to end violence against women. Key components that need to be included are women's poverty, housing, and childcare. Economic security and safe housing are essential for women to be able to leave violent situations. And we know that the gun registry has ended and Canada lost an important tool for keeping women safe from violence. We know we also need increased investment in social services and health care and education to make sure that women are safe. And as part of Canada's National Action Plan, as Angel spoke about, we need a public inquiry to examine and address the scale and severity of violence faced by Aboriginal women and girls in this country. It is an outrage and an inquiry would identify strategies to form part of a National Action Plan. The stakes in these discussions are very high as any agreement will hold member states accountable for taking action to end and respond effectively to gender-based violence. So on behalf of our sisters in over 175 countries around the world, Democratic Republic of Congo, Bangladesh, we're asking Canada to lead the way to an agreement at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women this March 2013. Let's build women's rights and reduce violence of all kinds in our daily lives. And to end, I'm just going to quote from the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, Michelle Bachelet, who says that violence against women and girls is not just a women's issue. It is a responsibility for all of us. We welcome 
men who are allies in this process. The violence is an outrage and it must be stopped. Time has run out for complacency and for excuses. Let us all together show the will, the determination to mobilize greater resources to end what is a scourge of all humanity, the violence against women. Let's see no more women being murdered. Father, you are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My grandfathers and mother church kicked my family my parents out of Ireland. The telegram for my birth announcement was sent from Canada a respectable four months later after the actual date of my birth. Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the A land where my mother could work while married, where my mother could work while pregnant. A land where my mother could work while mothering. Freedom, liberation, free wombs unite. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Canada, a land where my mother's daughter who was numerically adept, me, could choose to study mathematics and engineering, which she herself was forbidden to do by her own father in 1960. This land is your land. This land is my land. Canada, a land where I stood horrified, a few feet away from the now-closed women's center on my university campus while my friend revealed to me the atrocities that had occurred mere hours before in another engineering hall on another campus in another province. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that failed to save them all. Canada, a land where on December 6, 1989, a few months away from my own graduation from my first degree in mathematics, I pledge to never forget Genevieve, Helen, Natalie, Barbara, Anne Marie, Maud, Maurice, Maurice, Anne Marie, Sonia, Michelle. Annie, Annie, Barbara. Woo! The ladies who have name cards, so please come up to this side of the stage at this time. We're going to read the names of the women who have been murdered this year in Ontario by men. All of the stones, the tombstones you see behind you, represent women who have been murdered in Ontario since 1990 by men. Carissa Grandine, 30, Toronto. In October 2011, Carissa was rushed to hospital after police were called by her husband, reporting that his pregnant wife was in medical distress. Police found Carissa in the bathtub, but she later died in hospital. 
The cause of death was listed as drowning. Over six months later, in May of 2012, her 25-year-old husband, Philip Grandin, was charged with first-degree murder. Lisa Labitka, 45, mother of three children, Toronto. Lisa was found in the bedroom of her rented house in an upscale part of Toronto after her boyfriend called police from the home on New Year's Day to report her missing. Her body had reportedly been there for a number of days. Her boyfriend, Paul Hindle, was then charged with second degree murder. Okay, I'm going to be reading Robin Jerkins, 29 year old, mother of two, from Malvern. Catherine Newman, 43, mother of three children, Oakville. Catherine was found by a friend stabbed to death in her home. At about the same time, a man drove his car into police vehicles in the parking lot of a nearby police detachment, confronted police officers, and was shot to death by police at the scene. He was later identified by Kyle Newman, the recently separated husband of Catherine Newman. Julia Vichil, 44 of Rockwood, 36-year-old Xavier Murfra, was charged with her murder. Andreen Graham, 40. Mother of five children, Toronto. Andreen was found dying of a gunshot wound to the head in an alley behind a shopping mall where she was found by an area resident. She later died of her injuries in the hospital. Her boyfriend, Paul Black, later died in an altercation with the police in Richmond Hill Park, who were unaware of the murder at that time. The Special Investigations Unit determined that when confronted by the police, he repeatedly held a gun to his head and eventually shot himself. He had been the subject of a criminal complaint by Andreen in which he was court ordered to stay away from her. Andreen had decided to end their three year relationship and Black was upset about it. Nigisti Semrit, 55 year old mother of a force stabbed in an alleyway in Cabbage Town. A surveillance video of a male suspect is out, but no arrests. Sonia Albirani, 50, mother of three children, London. Sonia was found in her home suffering from stab wound by police and paramedics called to the scene. She later died in hospital of her injuries. Two young women were found outside the home visibly upset and crying. Police entered the house and arrested a man later identified as Sonia's husband, Chauki Albirani, 53. He was charged with second degree murder. Teresa Lefebvre, 46, mother of two, Sitzville. Teresa was found severely beaten by a baseball bat after police were called to her home by a man who said he had killed his wife. She was transported to hospital and put into an induced coma as a result of severe head injuries, but died about a week later. Her husband, Peter Lefebvre, was later found hanged in Stony Swamp Conservation Area. Police classified the incident as a murder-suicide. The couple was going through divorce. Barry Hepburn, 32. Barry. Mary and a friend were found with their throat slashed in a travel lodge hotel room. Also in the room was Mark Dobson, 22, suffering from injuries to his neck. All three were formerly from Alberta, but Mary and Dobson had moved to Barrie to live together. Her friend had reportedly arrived from Alberta to help Mary, who was facing back surgery. Dobson was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. Lackfear Diwali. 37, mother of two. Lackfear was found shot to death in her Brampton home after police received a desperate call from a young child saying his mother was hurt. The children were at home at the time of her murder and were turned over to Child Protection Services, which later placed them with her brother. A short time after the murder, her husband, Jet Tinder Dhaliwal, was arrested after a single car accident after fleeing the home. He was charged with second-degree murder. Neighbors reported that the police had been called to the home on a number of occasions as a result of problems. A vigil was organized by community members to honor Latvia and send a message to the children to restore their faith in humanity as well as to denounce all domestic violence. Yvette Lindo, 57, mother of one, Caledon. 
The bodies of a vet and her husband were found at their home in the rural community. Police ruled the deaths were a murder-suicide, but refused to publicly confirm the causes of death or reveal anything else about their investigation. Using other sources, journalists reported that Anthony Lindo, a vet's husband, had called 911 and said he killed his wife. Between that call and the police attendance at the crime scene, he committed suicide. Lee Edwards was a 59-year-old woman from Etobicoke, Ian Gray, 50, charged with her murder. Lourdes White and her husband Donald were discovered dead in their home in North Elmvale on March 26. Their 26-year-old son, Gregory, has been charged with two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of indecent interference with a human body. Guang Hao Liu, 41, Scarborough, mother of three. Over a number of weeks, body parts were found in areas around Toronto, and police investigations of the unfolding horrific details eventually led to her identity. Guang Hao had been reported missing by her boyfriend. According to acquaintances and police, we're able to link these events. Changi Jiang, 40, her estranged boyfriend, was charged with second-degree murder, but police have not yet identified the scene of the crime. Wang Hao was a Canadian citizen of Chinese descent who struggled most of her life, according to her parents. Cindy Sullivan, 40, from Trenton, mother of three. Cindy was found dead in a ground-floor apartment of the building where she lived. She had been visiting there from her own unit in the same building. Cindy had been reported missing, and neighbors within the building reported a lengthy argument and fighting in the apartment, and then silence. The cause of death was not reported. Ronald Shorey, 42, a man described as someone that Cindy had been dating before her death, was subsequently charged with second-degree murder. Joanne Underhill, 50, Sarnia, mother of three. Joanne was found stabbed to death in her home after police responded to a call. Two of her children were present in the home when police arrived. Joanne had separated from her husband in 2010. She worked as a resource support teacher at a health center for children and was a longtime member of the staff. Her estranged husband, James Province, 52, was charged with first degree murder. Madeline Hood, 19, of St. Catharines. Castle Farnsworth, 19, charged with murder and arson. Aisha Saludares, 40, Mississauga. Aisha's body was found in her home with obvious signs of trauma, according to police. Police would not provide details of the trauma, but indicated that it was her cause of death. Aisha worked as a mortgage agent and had been married to her partner for about two years. An arrest warrant was issued for her husband, Nelson Tayong Tong, 39, and he was charged with second-degree murder. Rita Adams, 59. Her body was found in a boarding house in Parkdale. She had been stabbed multiple times. Shanna Carter, 25, mother of one, Grimsby. Shanna's body was found in a wooded area north of Perry Sound in September of 2012, but she had been reported by, missing by her family in December of 2010 after her sister was unable to reach her about dinner plans. Shanna lived with her boyfriend of five years and the father of your, her young child at the time of her disappearance. According to media, her boyfriend told police she had stepped out for a cigarette and didn't return to the home. After her remains were found and identified, her former boyfriend, Christopher Lee Sharples, 35, was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Hilda Rowlink, 58, of North York, was stabbed to death. Her son, Andrew Rowling, 22, has been charged. Unknown woman, 52, Scarborough. Police found the lifeless body of a woman after a call of unknown trouble at a resident. Police did not release the woman's name, but described her murder as domestic in nature. They also would not release the cause of death. Kevin Noble, 52, was charged with second degree murder. Deborah Allen, 52, mother of two, Georgetown. 
Deborah was shot to death at her home, where her husband was later found dead from self-inflicted gunshots. Reportedly, Deborah had arrived home on a Saturday afternoon with a friend who later ran screaming up the street that her friend had been shot and seeking help from neighbors. Police arrived with hope of contacting the husband, but were unable to prevent the tragedy. Deborah Allen was the principal of a senior elementary school where she had worked for the previous five years. Cheyenne Charles, 16, was caught in the crossfire of the Danzig Drive shooting. She had been attending the barbecue with her family on July 16th, which, was, which also saw Joshua Yasse, 23, of Ajax, Ontario, killed and 23 others injured when gunfire broke out. Linda Thomas, 60 years old, murdered by 20-year-old Anthony Lim. Elaine Van Laforme, 48, mother of two. Mississauga New Credit First Nations Reserve. Elaine was found dead in a burned out home. The body of a man was also found at the scene and was identified as Rick Paulus, 52, of the Six Nations. Elaine's identity was determined by dental records some days after the discovery. Glenn Owen Hill, 60, who was reportedly LaForme's longtime and estranged partner, was charged with two counts of first degree murder. We now invite everyone uh, to join us in a moment of silence to remember these women. It's important that we not only remember these women and tell their stories, but that we break the silence and that we let our voices be heard that this is not acceptable and that violence against women must stop. So please join me as we let out a collective scream to break the silence. I'd like you all to look behind me. Are you all right with this? No. Are you all right with this? No. There are over 600 women. Each one of those, those tombstones represents one. I'm not all right with it. I'm, so I'm here again, year after year. I'm not all right with it. During our final meeting before the vigil, I had a frank conversation with a woman who works at the North York Women's Shelter, and I'd like to share with you some thoughts that she shared with me. She informed me about the severe lack of funding that is available for shelters across the city of Toronto to meet the needs of the women that go there for help. It's hard enough to actually make the decision to leave an abuser, but then to take that action and be denied support? It's heartbreaking. According to this woman, the shelters had to turn away two out of every three women that are referred to them. In addition, because of a severe lack of transitional housing and support available to those women, 71% of them, the women who leave their abusers, 71% of them return to their abusers after leaving the shelter. This is the man. Violence, the North York violence. Women's Shelter has just launched a capital campaign to bring a new facility to life which will provide the transitional housing and support services needed to help women escape violence. After the vigil, I truly encourage you to hear more about their campaign as well as listen to additional speakers and performers by attending our post-visual reception at Gabby's on Bloor Street. It's kindly being hosted by the North York Women's Shelter. Please join us for some free food, warm drinks, and to continue the conversation on how we can end violence against women. On behalf of the Women Won't Forget Collective, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight and braving the cold. I'd also like to pay special thanks to our volunteers, our partners, and to our speakers and performers for their contributions. 
We're a small grassroots collective, and we rely on the generosity of others for our funding to come out and tell the voices or tell the stories of these women each year. Your continued support and an amazing group of volunteers had allowed, has allowed us to hold this vigil since 1990. We encourage you to support the cause by dropping some money into one of the buckets around the memorial. It is important, it's very important, that we continue to gather year after year to tell the stories of these women who can no longer speak for themselves. We now would like to invite the Raging Grannies up to the stage, and as they sing our song for us, uh, we'd like you to lay your rose on the memorial boulder just behind me, if you have one, and if you don't, you're welcome to just go up in pairs. She's not coming. Do you want to take yeah, the other mic? No, I want to be near you. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. I don't blame you. Yay. My first night of this, so can you The song we're going to the song we're going to sing for you <clears throat> was written in November of 1990, and we have been singing this song, whose title is. Montreal remembered in various places, the subway system, on the streets, and here at this vigil ever since. And we won't stop singing it till our lives come to an end or till we provide the supports that will end violence to women. Drive all the love they were born with in the Montreal massacre died. We remember their ventures, honor their minds and hearts. We will not forget them, 14 women apart. We will cherish their memory, Fourteen women apart, they are not alone. Women and children die here, across our country men kill them by knife and blow and gun. We remember their promise. Lives cut short by hate. All the love that is in us, dedicate to redeem. Change the hatred and violence into love, healing pain. Thank you. 